What's up, guys? Steven over here. Yes, sir. Uh, obviously, uh, last time we saw you in Salt Lake City, you did a whole media day, and he didn't end up getting the fight. So when they announced this card was going to happen, did you want to be on this card for the opportunity to fight in Salt Lake? I did. I actually did because I owe them one because I didn't <laughs> get to fight last time. You know, everybody was looking forward to that Michelle Pajeda fight. He's doing money in a weight class higher, which is where she should be at. But, uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to be here, wanted to be out here, especially against somebody like uh, Joaquin Buckley who's going to bring it. Well, you say he's going to bring it. Um, Kevin Holland was in here, and he told this. Oh, I saw it. Y'all yeah. <laughs> got it out there on media quick. Yeah. He said that he doesn't think Buckley's the guy that'll stand and trade with you. Uh, so seeing that, are you like, well, maybe. And then Joaquin was in here earlier, and he's like, you know, this isn't a MMA fight. I can't take him down and, you know, ground yeah. and pound him. Oh, yeah, 100%. I, I, I mean, you go back and watch it. I think it was two fights ago or a fight ago he – uh, fought the big Russian dude. Last fight. Last fight. Yeah, he took him down. He won by takedown, you know. And uh, so I prepared for that. I knew that was. I I knew that was going to happen. At this point, you got guys who no longer want to stand and strike with me, which I think has, shows a testament to my striking. And they just want to take me down now. So I'm, I'll be ready wherever the fight goes. Joaquin also did an interview not too long ago where he was like, you know, he. Steven's not as nice as maybe people see in front of the cameras, and he kind of chalked it up to, like, once you start circling each other in the rankings, the energy just kind of changes because you might have to get into a fight. Do you kind of chalk it up as that, or Buckley trying to sell the fight, or does he actually think you're meaner than you give yourself I, off? I think he's trying to sell the fight. I mean, um, I think he brought it up, something that happened at International Fight Week, which yep. we were chatting the whole time. You know, can I get the fight? You know, see the fight. It's like, yeah, I'll, my people get in touch with your people. We'll see if the fight will happen. And I was sitting there talking with uh, Chris Wyman was doing some media. So it was me, my brother, and Marie V, Chris Wyman's um, wife, and with the kids. We were just sitting there chatting. And then Joaquin comes up, and I didn't really understand what he was trying to tell me about a fan saying, was talking crap. I don't know if he was saying that the fan was saying that I was talking crap or was he was talking crap. I don't know. I was just like, hey, man, it's all good. You know, it's cool. Like, I had no idea what he was saying, to be honest with you. He walked off, and we just started chatting. I guess he thought we were talking about him or something. No idea. So it, it kind of surprised me when I heard uh, the interview, like, a, a month later. I'm like, what? I don't remember saying anything to him. Man. I know there were fans trying to get us to, like, uh, you know, talk trash on each other, but I don't, I don't do that. I'm not good at it to begin with. Is it true that Kevin Holland referred to you as – Walking Buckley's grandfather. <laughs> he, he did. We were in the back. We were getting ready to go out to do some media at the at International Fight Week. And next thing I know, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get some, some food. They had like a spread out for us. I'm sitting there with my brother, my dad, my manager. And uh, Kevin Hall's like, yo, Grandpa. And I'm looking to see who. Like, I thought his grandpa was really there. And I'm like, and he's looking at me. I'm like, me? He's like, yeah, yeah, your grandpa. I'm dad, I, you know, Joaquin's grandson. You know, I beat Joaquin, you beat me, your grandpa. And I was like, oh, okay, I mean, I guess I'll, uh, I, 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 I guess that's cool. <laughs> so, yeah, he did, man. Did he, you just think he was calling you old? No, I don't think he, I guess he was, I mean, maybe. I mean, I, I don't know, am I the oldest guy on the card? I have no idea. Probably on the car. I heard I was the oldest guy, second oldest guy in the UFC behind Stipe, who's 42. But I think Clay's. Holly might be up there too. Holly, okay. But I think, uh, um, uh, um, what's his dang name? Uh, I forgot his name. I think Guida. Yeah, Clay Guida's older than me. I, I feel like your top five Guida's probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, I'm still a young buck, man. There's just still guys older than me in this, in the, in the UFC. And I have to ask, uh, Aldo was in here earlier, and what he said, I feel like I should ask you, you know, he's fighting Mario Batista, this other young kid coming up, and he's been around for so long, and Jose Aldo said, I'll fight whoever it takes to get to the UFC title. And I think when they announced you versus Buckley, people might have been surprised, because, you know, Leon was coming off a loss, Colby called you out, and then you're fighting this guy trying to make a name for himself again. Are you in that same mindset as, like, you'll just fight whoever it takes to get to the title? Yeah, man. I mean, I wouldn't say just to get to the title, but there's a lot of guys in the UFC divisions that try to hold on to their spots, you know. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Jake Ellenberger giving me a shot, Hendricks giving me a shot, Rory McDonald giving me a shot. And before I fought those guys, I wasn't even ranked, I don't think. But they gave me that opportunity. Um, I'm, the, I'm the type of guy to give these young bucks a chance to come up 
and see if they got what it takes to go on the top. I mean, I did it with Jeff Neal, Kevin Holland, Vicente Luque at the time, and now Buckley. So I don't mind. I, my goal is to, be, is to fight the best fighters in the world. Like, when I retire, like, who can say a very small percentage of the world can say that they've done that in this division, you know? So no regrets, my man. I mean, when they went, I mean, nobody wanted to fight Shavkat. And they were like, hey, you want to fight Shavkat? Let's do it, you know? Are you surprised that Shavkat hasn't fought since your fight? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I am surprised. I don't know if he was on some injuries or he's just waiting for the right opportunity. But uh, I thought it was going to be him and Ian Gary because they're kind of right there, you know. And the winner of that maybe fights the champ. But, um, no, I don't know how that's going to go. I think they might be giving Shavkat the chance. I mean, he's a tough guy. Very, I think that's a great fight, though. Mm -hmm. Both cancel each other out when it comes to the wrestling, and it becomes a striking fight. I think if it, if it goes early, if the fight ends early, it's Shavkat. But Blah, man, he's got cardio. He's just as fresh in the fifth round as he was in the first. So if it goes the distance, I'm, I'm thinking it might be Blah. And you made your debut 12 years ago on that same card as, you know, Poirier Holloway won. So I guess looking back to the state of the division back then when you had like the GSPs and the Hendricks and the John Fitches to now, like you said, a lot of these people are kind of holding their, their spot in these rankings. What do you make of the state of the welterweight division now? You know, you have a new champion. A lot of yes. guys aren't fighting each other. Just what do you make of everything going on at 170? Man, it, ke it keeps refreshing, like, after every welterweight fight, right? When, and when for the longest, it was stagnant. Like, you had the champ, and he, the, he was fighting kind of the same guys for the past two to three years. And it's like, come on, man, get somebody else up there. But now we got a new champ, and it's changed within the past, like, three to four years. You know, it was Usman, then it was Leon. Now it's Bilal. Like, who's next? Is it going to be Shavka? And, you know, I haven't fought since December, so I came down in the rankings. I think I'm ranked number nine at this point. But, um, you know, the, 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 I think it's great. I think it's good to keep these guys moving, you know, keep these guys moving. I don't like it when they stagnate. So you like Bilal's already calling out Shafkai, he's calling out Jack. He seems to be a champion that wants to fight the number one contender. Yes. That's how I think when you, when you get the title, you shouldn't pick. I think you should fight, uh, especially after maybe after that first fight, one or two fights, you fight who's coming up, and then you're able to pick or get that money fight or whatever. But when you get to the title, then you're just like, oh, I'm just wanting this guy right here. You know, I want Connor. It's like you got to kind of earn it a little bit, you know. And then unrelated to this fight, I don't know if I'm going to get to ask you again, um, what do you make of karate not being in the Olympics anymore? Uh, pfft, well, if it was Kyokushin karate, it would still be in the Olympics. You know what I mean? When they got the full contact, the, I mean, I think it was like the last Olympics when the guy got round kicked and knocked out. Like, come on, man, this is a combat sport. If there's a knockout, awesome. I mean, plus it would stink to get gold, but you won gold by getting knocked out, you know? So I think that had a lot to do with, with uh, it not being in the Olympics is because of the rule setting. Like, it's a combat sport. Let's go. Let's, I mean, y'all should be wanting knockouts to make it more exciting, more people tuning in. Are you surprised that given how popular karate was in California specifically for so long, like especially after the movies The Karate Kid and everything came out, LA kind of became the hub of like karate schools popping up that not even LA is having karate in the Olympics? Yeah, man. I mean, uh, it was great in the 80s. We know The Karate Kid came out. There's a lot of people wanting to venture out and, and or wanted to train karate because of The Karate Kid. But then you started seeing these like McDojo schools popping up left and right, people all about it just for the money and not putting out good students. So it watered our style down, it watered the karate down. That's why people said it would never work in a real street situation. So, you know, there are schools out there like my dad's and his, his instructors and other schools out there that karate is legit. I mean, look at Lyoto Machida. He, he was the first to do it in the UFC. And it was like, he was my inspiration, one of my inspirations besides GSP and those guys to, to start competing because people were talking about about karate. And it works, man. It does. Uh, and then last one for me, uh, can I just get your thoughts on the main event between Alex and Khalil? Oh, man. Okay. First off, it's very hard to go against a guy or not, not pick a guy like Alex Pereira to win. Okay, now Khalil Roundtree, I'm excited for this fight because it's going to be a stand-up battle, like Muay Thai versus Muay Thai. They're both heavy hitters, and Khalil Roundtree could put him to sleep just as easy as he is Pereira can put him to sleep. It's just, um, I think Alex has the edge. He's very calm. I think he's got a great, he does a great job of keeping the distance, and he's a, he's a, 
he's a sniper when it comes to his shots, right? He's very patient. The only thing that I fear about Alex is staying in the pocket. You saw against Izzy Adesanya, he's not the type of guy that throws a combination and then moves. He stays in the pocket until he finishes, which is why Izzy Adesanya ended up knocking him out. He stayed in the pocket, he bounced off the cage, boom, and down he went. If he stays in the pocket with Khalil Roundtree, Khalil Roundtree can put him to sleep. There would be no takedowns, no takedowns at all. This is going to be a striking battle, and I'm all for it. So I am leaning towards my man Alex Pereira because he's on a tear. Um, I think he, uh, he's the calmer fighter. He's, the, he's a sniper. He picks his shot, and I think he's got the power just to put him to sleep, and he can keep the range. Stephen Red over here. Yes, sir. This is a really small regional MMA question, but there was a small story that came out that on Monday you went out to a local gym and just spoke to a bunch of different fighters here in the state of Utah. I saw a ton of posts about it and a ton of people just saying how grateful they were that on such a busy week, you've got a million other things that you could rather be doing. You're just talking to some of these young up and coming fighters. What compelled you to do that? Man, this is why I do what I do. You know, I've been in the martial arts since I was three years old. I know what the martial arts has done for me, not just as a martial artist, but just being a good human being. And it's a great lifestyle. And you get these guys who, some of the guys there were on the Contender Series, and they, you know, they're in the UFC. So, and they're like, man, I look up to you. I'm like, are you kidding me? These guys are karate guys too. Come, you know, pretty close to where, where I'm from. And to be able to see that amateur, um, pro level, and even in the UFC, a lot of these guys look up to me and, and anything I can do to kind of give back to my community, especially to the fighter. It's a great life. Yes, it's tough. It's hard. But um, this is why I do what I do, man, just to give back to, to, to these local fighters and um, these, these up and coming fighters who want to make it to the UFC. It can be done. You know, look at me. I look back. I, I told my dad when I was 12 years old that I was going to be in the UFC one day. He took me to UFC three. It was in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Grady Cole Center. And I told my dad then I was going to do this one day. And all, it's easy, but it's not easy. All I did was just didn't stop. I didn't stop my training. You know, when all my friends are going out partying, I was in the gym training. You know, so it's as easy as that. I mean, it's hard to go through the training. That's the tough part, but just don't stop. And that's what I told these guys. I was like, look, man, it's, you, you're going to have your wins. You're going to have your losses. But... People are going to look at you on how you, you know, on how you take those losses and your wins. So that people will remember that. You, uh, that last question before you, I uh, ask mine, you have such potent analysis. After the MMA career is over, do you hope to become potentially some sort of a broadcast analyst in some capacity? I know you already do YouTube and things like that, but go even you know, a step further. I would love it. I would love it. I did some stuff when, when the UFC was with a different company, not ESPN, and it was great. But at the time, I was running the school and training you know, full time. So it was a little tough because that's a full time job. You watch a lot of these guys. Um, you know, Cormier um, and these other analysts, they do a lot of work studying and they're fighting, give, giving them phone calls. And at the time, it was just a little too much. But 100%, I would love to do this, just to stay in the game, you know, to be in it still. Now, if, if or whenever I do retire, that's not going to stop my martial arts journey. You know, I've got other fighters that I have um, coming up. They help me get ready for mine, and I help them get ready for theirs. So... I'll do this, like I said, as long as my body will let me. Or when my dad says, all right, man, you're taking too much punishment or your heart's not in it. And sometimes us as fighters, we may not feel that. We were like, oh, you know, my heart is in it. But really, it's not, you know. And I've been there before. I've been there early in my, my kickboxing career before I ended up tearing every leg in my left leg. I was burnt. And I didn't know how to tell him that I didn't want to do this anymore. And then it came as a blessing, actually, when I ended up tearing my knee. And took, I was out for three years, kind of rekindled that flame, and has been on fire ever since. Yes, sir. Steven over here. Oh, he got it. He got it. Who was it? Uh, we'll go over here. Okay. Because uh, you said something about uh, when you were asked about the, can the canceled fight and everything in Salt Lake City and whatnot. You, I believe the words you used were you felt like you owed something to this community, to the city, to the event, something like that. Like. I just kind of want to go a little deeper into that. What did you feel like you owed after that fight was canceled, I guess, where you wanted so badly to be back on this card in Salt Lake? Well, you know, obviously I want to win the fight, um, but I also want to put on a good show. There was a lot of people that have been, you know, DMing me, messaging me, 
you know, I can't wait to see your fight. Can't wait to see your fight here in Salt, Salt Lake City. You know, locals wanting to see this fight. And then it not happening. Of course, I was disappointed that my opponent didn't make weight, but I was also disappointed in the fact that I wasn't able to put on a show for everybody here in Utah. So now that this, this fight has happened, it was like, man, back in Utah, let's, let's do it. So I, that's what I felt like I owed them, a show. Hopefully me and Joaquin will uh, put that on this Saturday. And he just lay on me, but we'll see. I'll be ready for it, though. <laughs> Speaking of him potentially laying down and, and you being a striker, obviously, I wanted to ask you, man, you saw in Embedded this week a lot of drilling submissions from you. How do you feel as though, or what's the confidence like in your ground game, rather? I mean, it's there. I mean, I, I've always had confidence in the ground game. It's like earlier in my career, I think I, I just got done fighting uh, Matt the Immortal Brown. Right, went the distance. He ended up out wrestling me, and everybody's like, "Oh, Wonder Boy ain't got no wrestling." So my next opponent was Nashawn Burrell. I out wrestled him, and then I out wrestled um, uh, Chris Clements. And then after the fight, I forgot who it was. They were they came up to me. They were with the UFC, and they were like, "Look, Stephen, it wasn't your wrestling that got you here." I'm like, "All right, I'm picking up what you're putting down." So. You know, for a long time, I was just focused on that, putting on a show with my striking. That's what people want to see, you know, because um, as soon as the fight goes to the ground, especially when it comes to me, people boo. But at the top, man, right now, it's very difficult to get back up to the top if I don't use it. So it's, it's um, the, the past three training camps has been specifically a lot on my submissions and grappling and takedown defense. Even though I lost to the fight with Shavkat Rachmanov, I was still happy with the fight. You can still lose a fight and still be happy with it because my goal is always the title, right? But a, a little mindset switch when, if that's the only goal, it, it kind of dulls a little bit. So now my goal is how good can I get? That's my goal. At 41 years old, how good can I get? How much better can I get? And that's my mindset when I wake up every morning. I ask myself that. And that's what fuels me to go train every day. And that's why I've got a lot of questions. People are like, man, you've been in the game for a long time. How do you still have you know, the energy to do this, man? How do you, how do you have the, the drive to keep fighting? And that's it, just to continue to get better. I was happy with that fight because there were some things that I was working on that was working. He took him a very hard time taking me down in the first and early half of the second round. He ended up getting me down, took advantage of it, and it was over, but still, I was like, lost, but things were working. Let's go, let's keep it up. So I came in 28 when I was in the UFC, a little uh, fairly late in the game, and I was more focused on my striking up until that point. And to be honest with you, I'm still learning, man. Absolutely. And last but not least from me, I saw a lot of people on social media, Instagram specifically, they were saying that they're predicting a Wonder Boy submission this week, man. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, hey, it could happen, baby. You never know. I might sneak one of those in. So, yeah, man, we've been working on it nonstop. I've got great coaches back home. Um, you know, of course, my dad, Brad Strain, my buddy Gino, Weston Wilson, uh, Tom Lane, Chris Weidman. Got a whole good, great team around me to help me get to this point. So I'm going to put on a show. Uh, Steven, right over here. You're known as one of the nicest guys in the UFC. You have, you're just really positive. You have this great golden retriever energy to you. I'm just wondering, is there any moment on fight night, whether it's in the locker room, the walkouts, entering the octagon, where you have to maybe get a little angry and let the pit bull out a little bit? I've never. I don't think I've ever, since my very first fight, kickboxing fight up until now, never angry. Um, and I was taught that just because it took me a little, especially as a teenager in my early 20s, when that testosterone's flowing, you know, you're just like, ah. You know, but you got to learn to dial it back because you start getting angry, you start doing things you normally wouldn't do out there. You see fighters do that. They get angry, they get mad, and the next thing you know, they start swinging for the fences, leave it on self open, and then they get put out. So I learned to kind of channel that into, into just, just my, my, my fight mindset, right? I know there's a time when I can chill, hang out with other people, but whenever it's time for business, it's time for business. I go out there, no animosity, but I'm going to get this done, right? I'm going to knock you out, I'm going to love you after, or I'm going to get knocked out, and I'm going to love you after. And you know, it was just your best time. So no animosity, I'm never, I'm never angry. I'm focused, yes. I know what needs to be done, yes, but I'm never angry. You're not like super happy either, you're just kind of. Yeah, yeah, I'm not like, ah, you know, jumping <laughs> around. I'm like, why am I doing this, dude? <laughs> no, no, for real. I mean, uh, you know, they say whenever you step out there, if you're not nervous, that's the time to kind of hang it up, you know. 
but every time. I mean, just being up here with you guys. Anytime I leave my hotel room, I feel the nerves. But that lets you know you're live. Like, how many people are willing to do what we do on a daily basis, especially during fight week, the weight cut, the media, you know, all the nerves, the anxiety that comes along with it. I think that's what gets addicting. When you get guys who want to retire or they come out of retirement or they should retire but they don't retire, is they're chasing that feeling still. They go home every day and it's like, it's not the same, mm. you know? So I think uh, – I love it. I learned, I learned to love it. I hate it at the same time, but I love it at the same time. Because after the fight, win or lose, it's like, let's do this again. <laughs> you know? Yeah, John Jones said is butterflies information is what he says. Yeah, so I, I, I agree. That. Butterfly information, man. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you all.